OCK. Du har ikke strøm. Jeg har nemlig ikke strøm. Jeg, øh, jeg ved, at øh, det burde der være. Du har ikke strøm. Er det alle steder, der ikke er strøm? Hvad med lamperne? Er lyse dem? Jeg, jeg har ikke strøm der. Jeg Hvad? Man bør nok ikke pille ved det der. Ej, nu nummeret er. Har jeg strøm? Jeg har strøm. <laughs> der er der strøm. <laughs> ja. Skal vi sige, vi klarer den? Du klarer den indtil videre. Okay, good morning. I was just told that the uh, outlets up where you're sitting, there's no power up there, but did you know if anyone kind of made someone else available, aware of it yesterday? Who was that? So, that was you saying it. So someone should know. We'll see what happens. I will, uh, in the break if there's time, I will call out an error as well. Um, see if I can find the right person to call. So, I think I would like to just get started and then talk a little bit about peer grading a little bit later. But for now, I just want to get started with today. So, last week we looked at the theoretical properties. But now we're going to look at how do we actually estimate things from data? How do we use estimates of autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation function to say something about which model to use and also something about validation. I don't think there will be time to do how to estimate parameters and models, so I'll keep that as a side note. I'm prepared if we have time, but I don't think there will be time. So I think this is I'd be wrong to say the most important slide today, 
But if you know the intention of this, then you are actually good on the way. So often when you're going to do some modeling, you have at least related to time series analysis, you'll have some data of some things. You will also have maybe a theory that is behind what is going on, and you may have some physical insights, hopefully. So it may be that you just do, you could say, pure statistics, but you may also know something about the system that you could use. So what you do is first you try to identify, given the information head up here, which model is appropriate. And that's, you could say, one of the biggest challenges, and that is what we'll be doing for assignment three. Um, then given a model structure, just to make it easy, you say it's a simple linear regression, then you fit the linear regression model, and then you check if the model is okay. As in, are there any parameters that are not significant, or are there, say, assumptions that are not fulfilled? That's the easy. If no, well, given what you've learned so far, maybe you have a better guess for what could be a good model. Hopefully you do. Otherwise, you have to make up a better guess. And if everything is okay, well, then you can go and use the model for predictions. So in assignment one, you, you, were, you were told to use a filter to just predict. We did not kind of estimate it as a statistical model as such. It was just a method that we ran through. The only model that we made was the linear regression model, which most of you said is not appropriate because the observations are, are not individual, uh, independent. So in that case, you could say you could easily identify a linear trend and estimate it and say, well, it's not appropriate what we've done. Back to square one. So that's what I want you to think over and over again. Whenever you have a model, you loop around in this part here. And that's the way, at least what we'll get to later, is how to do it in practice, is to make a model of something that you know needs to be there, and then you see, what else do I need? So you do kind of a stepwise model building. So the question is, when we have some data, how do we Hej. Det er korrekt. Det var derfor, jeg tænkte, du lignede sådan en, der kunne sådan noget. Du lignede en, der kunne sådan noget. Desværre ikke, nej. Jeg har kigget overhovedet ved, at det går efter. De bliver styret et eller andet sted, for vi kan ikke kende det. Okay, det er da spændende. Jo. Du har ikke blevet instrueret i brug af pulten derovre, ikke? Jo, pulten kan jeg godt bruge. Ja, men du er ikke blevet instrueret, hvordan det bliver styret et eller andet sted fra, de der stikkontakter. Der bør ikke være noget strøm i pulten. Altså, jeg kender pulten, har jeg brugt alt, hvad der er. Der er ikke noget her i, jeg kan styre, som har noget med strøm at gøre. Det er rent, øh, kan man sige, audio-ting her i huset. Og lys, ja. Øh, jeg stod og kiggede på et lille skab, der sidder hernede, men det er Evigør, der er der kørt. Hvad? Jeps. Tak for noten. Så vil jeg ikke fejle med lidt yderligere. <laughs> okay, so uh, back again. For those of you who do not understand Danish, he is the electrician trying to figure out how to get power. And he was also the guy walking around yesterday. And there's somewhere, probably somewhere in the basement, where this is controlled, but they don't know where that fuse is. <laughs> At least not yet. Okay, so what we have to is to figure out how to model data like this. So we need to figure out which structure to use and then estimate parameters, which will be later as said just before. So what we did last week was to look at ARIMA models. And then we, for particular models that we looked at, we could see some patterns in the autocorrelation function which could help us identify what is actually the model. I don't know if you remember from last week. I will recap that in a moment. But first, what we did last week was to look at the theoretical autocorrelation 
function or autocovariance function for at first. Well, in practice, you have some data, so you don't know what the theoretical relation is. You need to do something from the data. And at first, when you look at it, well, the definition of the autocovariance at lag k, we can write it subscript u u just to indicate it's for the u series. Sometimes you just omit that if there's no doubt which series is in play. And sometimes we'll take gamma hat to indicate it's an estimator of the analytical um, value that we wanted to have. What we have here on the right-hand side, yt minus the mean value of y multiplied by yt plus k. That's a typo there. That will be corrected in the break. A new version will be uploaded. Um, minus mu hat. Oh, so sorry, no, that's correct. I just couldn't read it from here. t plus the absolute value of k. So it doesn't matter if we're going for negative lag or positive lag. We discussed that last week, that going forward in time and backward in time, assuming that things are stationary, it doesn't make any difference. So the one thing here that is a little bit, I wouldn't say tricky, but you have to look at the sum here. I go from t equals 1 to n minus the numerical value of k, or absolute value of k. So that means when I look at this, I will never leave the integral from yt to y, uh, so y n, y1 to yn. I could let this sum here go from k to n, but then I'll just have to change the subscripts over here. So there are many different ways of writing the same thing. The important thing is I take the product of all those pairs that have time k difference. That's what I do. And then there's one thing here that I have not mentioned so far that is a little bit odd. Yes? Why you're asking the question I was just about to ask. <laughs> no, exactly. Why do I divide by n and not n minus the absolute value of k? Initially, you think that it would be a good, good idea to just normalize by the number of observations in the sum. Um, I fully agree. The reason why you don't is that then you cannot guarantee that this is actually an autocovariance function. So it means that because what happens is that you have some observations in the ends that are only part of parts of it. So most observations in the middle are part in both a future and a previous, but when you go to the end, they only part in one side of the product, and the first uh, one to k minus one is also only part in one product. So there are some tail properties there that are not covered. And that means that you can actually have a, well, if you go to the correlation, you would have some correlations that gets above one. Just a numerical feature. So normalize it by n instead of n minus the absolute value of k means that we are sure that this will actually behave and what the way we want it to be. But it also means, as you were kind of indicating, that this is not an unbiased estimator. It's biased. So the correlations are slightly smaller than what we want them to be. So in R, you can just use the ACF function. And if you want the covariances, you have to specify. So the default is to get the correlation structure. Um, I have the comment here on the 10n here on this next slide, asymptotically, it's central. So whenever n is large relative to k, everything is fine. And typically, n is supposed to be large enough relative to the k that you have of interest that it doesn't matter. But if you look at this, so the expectation of this is you can say that there's this k over n factor that we are away from what we want to do. Now, 
What do you think would happen if you have, say, 100 observations and you calculate the sample autocovariance function up to like 100? So you specify k equal 100 as well, or 99. I would get almost zero because I only have one element in my sum, and I'll still normalize by 100. That's a typical error to do because software will just do the calculations. So make sure that you don't bring k anywhere near n. As long as you are away from that, you're fine. I'll show an example later where, where just uh, with some code, just to show what happens. Uh, so when, if you get to do that on your own, you should be aware <coughs> that that was not the right solution. So, and another thing is that these estimators from the previous slides are also actually correlated with themselves. So if you see some patterns at some high lags that are not, you can say, physically meaningful, then you should not pay much attention to them. Also, but I'll get back to that, remembering then when we make estimates and draw, say, a 95% confidence interval, one out of 20 estimates are supposed to be outside. And if they're correlated, well, one more or less doesn't matter too much. So what happens if the actual series is non-stationary? We can still perform this calculation because we assume they have a finite sample. So we can just do it. Then we get something looking sort of like this. So what we get is that the auto covariance goes very slowly towards zero. It will go to zero at some point, but just very slowly. Um, and I think now is the time I will just show you simulating the same thing as just before. It's an ARI 1,1 model. So it's an ARMA, ARIMA 1,1,0, where the AR parameter is 0 0.6. And I can use the function arima.sim specifying a model and just say how many observations do I want. And if I just plot that, I get something out. Um, next thing is to look at the autocorrelation for, for this one. And you see that, as in the graph on the slide, you have a nice exponential tail here, but it goes very slowly to zero. If I do what I said you should not do, go for calculating, setting ma the maximum lag equal to the number of observations, I get something odd. Sometimes it's even more odd than what I have here. I could probably construct an, an example that is like that. But here it's not so clear that it actually goes to zero. Um, I can create something that is worse. Probably if I set this to be lower. If I do it again, I have some odd patterns like this. But you should not trust what happens out there. You should not do this. But the first part here is appropriate. And here it's very clear that this does not go to zero very fast. And what is sufficiently fast is kind of a there's no clear way to say that. If we, instead of making a model, I should go out and do it with the same model as before. So these were the original simulation from before. If I simulate the same model, but I do not set d equals 1, but d equals 0, so I just have a pure AR1 model. If I do the same thing, the data, the simulation looks somewhat different. Before you had some kind of stationary behavior, more continuous. If I now calculate the ACF, now it goes sufficiently fast to zero. If I take the one level differencing 
of the previous of the Ari model and do the same thing, it's almost the same as expected because here I just took the differences of the non-stationary model from before and calculated the autocorrelation function. If I had calculated the partial autocorrelation function as well, I would only get something in lag 1 that is significantly different from 0, at least that's what I should expect, because it's an AR1 model. So we can also simulate other models, just to say how to simulate. So if I want to simulate a seasonal model, there is, a, you can say, a small challenge is that the arima.sim function does not take seasonal models. But you can specify a non-seasonal model that has the same behavior. You just have to make, if you have season 12, you need to make a model that has 11 zeros as coefficients and then the seasonal coefficient that we want. That effectively gives us, so we we'll make a 12 order polynomial where the first 11 coefficients are zero and then we get the one that we want. So if we simulate with this, this is the same that we calculated last week. If you plot the data, it looks like this. You can sort of see that there is a sort of seasonal pattern here. I don't know if you can see that, but it's kind of the distance between the peaks is kind of uniform. It's not very clear. Now it is. Calculating the autocorrelation function for that sequence, I get a clear signal in lag 0, lag 12, and 24. Now the question is, is this going sufficiently fast to zero? Well, effectively, I only have two observations. I only have two points in the season, a 12 and a 24. So you cannot actually say if this is going to zero. You can say the values are so small already, so it's probably fine. But you could actually not, we'll get back to that, you cannot say if the 36, is that actually zero, or do we have an exponential going to zero? I don't know if you remember from last week, that we talked about for the AR model, the autocorrelation function goes exponential to zero, whereas for the moving average type models, you have a number of significant values and then it's zero. So if we want to calculate, we could say I want to do it up to lag 50, and here you can easily see that it continues being just smaller and smaller and smaller. So I think in this case, you would say that there's an exponential decay towards zero. And if I also calculate the partial autocorrelation function, well, I do expect to get something in lag 12, and I hope not to see anything in lag 24, because that confirms me that it's an AR1 model in season 12. And just... Uh, that was probably why. Um, adding what we did last week, the theoretical values, we see that in this case we get actually quite close. In particular, we'll get back to that, this is a 95% confidence interval. So given the width of this, our estimates, well, in one, it's of course always perfect. Because the correlation with yourself is always at the current time is one, per definition. Okay. So for the autocorrelation function, if you want to calculate the sample autocorrelation, well, you take the sample autocovariance function and normalize it by the variance. So that's a first, a totally the same way as we did for the theoretical purposes last week. If the input signal is white noise and k is different from zero, then the expectation of the sample autocorrelation is zero. And it's based on n terms, so it's the sum, it's one over n 
That's how it scales for the variance. And finally, if we have something with variance 1 over n and we want to make a 95% confidence interval, well, we could say that we use 1.96 as our scaling, but we'll just use 2. So plus minus 2 and then the square root of the variance, that's the interval that is drawn. You can say, well, why use 2? Well, we also do not use n minus k, we just use n. So there are some small biases here. So nothing is perfect right here. These are estimators. But when you look at a graph like the one before, when you look at graphs like this down here, you're not able to see if a peak is outside or on or just inside with a difference between a factor of 2 and 1.96, at least not with most screens that I've seen. The resolution is just high no not high enough. So it's not an exact science in that sense. It's more like, is there a signal or is not a signal? So and you do it using the autocorrelation function. The partial autocorrelation function, well, you do the same thing effectively. You have the sample partial autocorrelation function. I will tend to just say the partial autocorrelation function that we estimate, but it is, and it'll be clear from the context whether it's a sample or it's the analytical value that we used. And you can use the so called Joule Walker equations. I made a note on, in the book, um, it's on page 122. Um, to solve for this, basically what you do is that you calculate all the autocorrelation functions and then you have a simple matrix equation that you solve for the partial autocorrelation functions. So it turns out that since it's based on the same estimates from up here, the uncertainty is also the same. So the confidence interval is again plus minus 2 over the square root of n. And you can do the ACF functions and specify the type as partial or PACF, and you actually don't need to specify the type. It will just do it as I showed you in the example just before. So this is kind of a sum up of what I did and what we kind of started doing uh, last week. Now I'll see if this works. So what you have is when you have an autoregressive model of order p, then for the autocorrelation function, you will see some damped exponential and or sine functions. We have so far mostly looked at something that is damped exponential. If the characteristic polynomial that we looked at last week um, phi of set inverse equal to zero, if you solve that and we get complex roots, that's when we get the sine function, get some oscillations in the autocorrelation function. Whereas for the partial autocorrelation function for an autoregressive model, when we get beyond the order of the model, it is zero. As we saw in the example before, for the partial autocorrelation function of the AR1 model, you only have something in lag 1. And you can say, luckily, the moving average model is just reverse. For the autocorrelation function, if there's a signal up to lag Q, and then it becomes zero, that's a clear indicator that it's a moving average model. If as well, in the partial autocorrelation function, you see something that goes slowly to zero. The same thing is if the theta of set inverse equals zero, if the roots in that polynomial are complex, then you'll see some oscillations. Whereas if they're non-complex, you'll just see a damped exponential. If you then have an armor model, it should not be a surprise that you get the sum of both features. That means that you will have an initial something that is different from zero plus an exponential. It's not exactly a plus, but 
when you look at it, it looks like, well, you have an exponential behavior in both the autocollision function and in the partial autocollision function. That was the wrong one I dragged down. Uh, let me try again. That was what I wanted. So, what I want to do now is to show you some examples. And then I froze the slide from just before, so that you can see here the time plot of what we have. Then we have the autocorrelation function of the data from up there and the partial autocorrelation function of the data up there. What I want you to do is then to look at the list down here of possible models and then think of what could this actually be. I think the first one is a little bit different than the other ones. So let's take the first one just together. So what do you see here in the autocollation function and the partial autocollation function? What do you see? After leg like one, it's, uh, it's close enough to zero. Well. Actually, the first one here is not leg like one, but leg like zero. All right, okay, so after leg like zero. So anything ex except for leg like zero is zero. That means the partial autocollision function will also just be zero everywhere. So in that case, you should all know which kind of model you have. Are there anyone who has in doubt? So his, this means that there's no autocorrelation. So if we look over here for the autocorrelation function, we don't have an exponential we don't, but, but we do see that it is the partial autocollision function is zero when k is greater than zero. So this says that there is no a AR probably. But we don't see anything here either. So there's no AR and no moving average. So we have white noise. If we go for another model, like this, things look a little bit different, right? What I want you to do now is to look at this. I won't ask you, but I want you all to kind of think of what it is. You're allowed to speak together a little bit just around if you are in doubt. And I want you to figure out which of the models down here it is that you're looking at.
Yeah. Okay, so the way we do now is that I will count to three, as in one, two, three, and then you say the number of which model you think it is. So one, two, three. Two. I heard some twos and some trees, mostly twos, and then I was happy about that. Because it is an AR1 model. Because, well, what we look at is where, which of the autocollation function and the partial autocollation function goes to zero the fastest. In this case, we have quite some lags here that are significant, but we have only one over here. This here is in lag one. So if we look at what we have over there, the partial autocollation function is zero when k is greater than one. So the, it's an AR1 model. So this is the next one. The models to choose from are the same, but it's a different model that is used up here. And the procedure will be the same, so have a look, think, discuss if you need to. Okay, are you ready for this one? Yes. One, two, three. Three. Ah. So yes, it's an AR2 model because you have two significant peaks in the autocollation, in partial autocollation function, and you see something exponential over there. Now, next model. It's not as informative. say which one it is. There are many different options here that you could argue for. So you could say one model. Although exponential thing. You can say this one looks a little bit more exponential, but most of it is inside the confidence interval. So you cannot really distinguish. So if you say that this is exp exponential, then, well, then you might as well just call it an AMA 1,1 model. So the appropriate thing to do in a case like this is to start with but we'll get back to that, to start with fitting either MA1 or an AR1 model and see what you get out then from the residuals. But we'll get back to that. I have another one, which I hope you can guess.
Okay, are you ready? One, two, three. Five. Ah, I'm happy. Anyone in doubt? Then I won't say more, except that I'll change for an, an, another one. Yes? Uh, I also came forward to that it was, it was five, but I was uh, curious. It says AR1. And if I look at the slide over there, it has to be, you know, uh, zero for K larger than B. And, you know, at uh, lag five, it's not zero. Well, it's an AR1 with season five. Okay. So when you only, so if you only look at the seasons and ignore everything else, then lag five is the first, it, it's what corresponds to P equals one. Thank you for asking. So, next one. There's only one more than this one. Okay, are you ready? One, two, three. <laughs> you were not ready or, but okay, I heard a few fours and a few more sixes. Was that correct? Can I hear a lot of sixes? One, two, three. Six. Ah. <laughs> now, again, it's the same story as, bef as a couple of examples before. You will not be able to say this is definitively this particular model. The true model is the AMA 2,2 model. But it's sort of like guessing you need a model that has four parameters more than the one you start off with. I mean, nothing. So it's not realistic that you can actually guess that. It's sort of like looking at a multivariate data set and say, I want these four predictors without actually knowing anything. You just say, I just want these four um, out of the 20 that you could pick. So again, it's one of the cases where you need to do something in smaller steps to actually figure out what's going on. Um, yes? I mean, how just, if you just look at the table. Yes, then I see that there is an exponential part here, and there's also a tendency when I look at this, you can say, yes, it's only marginally outside in these places, but it looks like a damped harmonic. Yes, it does, but how would you tell the difference between 1-1 one, one and 2-2? Two, two? Because the table doesn't... I won't. Ah, okay, fine. My, my point is that I would say that there is some AR and some MA, so I might actually just fit an ARMA 1,1 one, one model, and then I'll look at the procedures from that model and see that there's still work to do. But we'll, we'll get to that. So, something slightly different. I think I will cut this one quick and just ask you one, two, three. <laughs> that was maybe a little bit too quick. <laughs> so what do you see here? What is the first thing that you should observe? 
Exactly. So the autocorrelation function does not go to zero inside the interval of up to like 20 as we calculated here. So that means that we are in some kind of an ARIMA model. And then you cannot guess which model it is from this. You need to do something more. The true model is the ARIMA 2, 1, 0. But you should not be able to tell from this. What you should do would be to do the same thing as I did in the example before. Do you remember? The small code example I did just before, what did I do? I simulated a non-stationary ARIMA 1, 1, 0 model. And then afterwards, I simulated just an AR1 model with the same parameter. And then I compared the ACF of the two. But then I took the first non station model and calculated the differences. So I calculated the one lag difference operator, and then I looked at the autocorrelation function again. That compares to set this to zero. And then you would have the autocorrelation function of an AR2 model, and you'd be fine. So just another non stationary process. What you typically, you will see this. And you'll often just see there's a partial autocorrelation function that is very close to one. And then nothing more. That is what you typically see when you have something that is non-stationary. Of course, when you look at the time, uh, at the data as such, I mean, you should not be in doubt. The mean is not the same over time, right, in this case. At least not in this interval. So. You will have to, and as always, a good thing, plot the data. It's very easy. You don't need to figure out any complex model. Just make a simple plot of the data so you can see what is going on. If you difference the data, as is shown here, just the one like difference, you get something like, like this. And if you then look at it again, uh, I already disclosed the answer, so I won't ask you this time. Or maybe I should anyhow. Um, you have an exponential tail here, and then you have something in lag 1 and something in lag 2. So we have an AR2 model given by the first row up here, but we have an AR2 model for the difference data. So this is the model that we have. I hope that is clear. So for doing the differencing of the data from before, it becomes fairly easy to see what is actually the true model, at least in this case. So then the challenge is, how many times do you need to do differencing? I've only done it once right now. Typically, that is just what you need. But you have to pick the order of that. And the saying is, you have to do it such that the autocorrelation function goes sufficiently fast to zero. I love saying that, but I also know how, how difficult it is to say, actually use that for something. Because what is sufficiently fast? It's definitely not like this, because it doesn't go to zero within the up to tw like 20. But you could have some seasonal patterns that add some weird structure to it as well. So it's, it's difficult to say what is actually needed. There's one more thing that you can look at, but we'll get to that when you start estimating models. Basically, what we have up here, if you look at this model as a model, as an AR model, what is this? It's an AR1 model where the parameter is minus 1, right? It's an AR1 model. So if I have the model, what I have up there as a model, if I have it as yt equals to yt minus 1 plus it's a random walk approximation, and then afterwards, when I have these epsilons, that's what I plotted up there. If that was white noise, 
this would be the model, right? I know there's no epsilons up there, but thinking of it, you have a parameter here that is equal to one. Usually you test whether, but here, if you have an AR1 model, it's interesting to look at whether that parameter is actually equal to one, because that indicates that you need to do differencing instead. So that, that's another thing you can use as a helper. So in practice, D is typically zero, sometimes one, rarely two, almost never anything beyond that. Think of it also in a more geometric way. When you look at D equals zero, <coughs> you're, mod you're modeling the mean value. When you have D equals to one, you're modeling the change in slope of this. This is the change in slope. When you have D equals two, well, then you're modeling the change in curvature. And if you are D equals three, then you're modeling the rate of change of curvature. It's not that often you go out there. It's often that you may have to go to the second order derivative to do something, but not to the third order when you have to deal with physical systems. Um, so that's another motivation for saying, usually you should not look at D greater than two. And the same thing applies for lowercase d as for uppercase d. Uppercase d is for the seasonal model. And sometimes you can say you can choose whether you want to do seasonal differencing or you do seasonal uh, differencing of, of order one, um, like one. And there you should kind of look at the context. Remembering on the first slide, say, use your physical knowledge about the system. Are there anything that tells you you should do one and not the other. So there's a lot of places here when you're doing this modeling where there's some freedom to choose. It also means that when you get to assignment three, I, don't, I know it's not today, it's next week, um, if you all come up with the same solution, I will fire you all for plagiarism because I want you to make individual adjustments. And I want you to argue for what you do. And it's the reasoning about it that shows that you know what you're doing. If you just do a random model, uh, that's easy, it takes five seconds. You need to argue and say, why is this model the least bad that you can find? Because, I mean, when you get to real life data, you won't always find a perfect model. Typically you find a model that is okay, and then you have to find the one that is the least bad. So, again, look at the physical or practical application. Another thing that sometimes happens is that you look at not the full data set, but just a sample of the data set, and then you get you can say a different interpretation of what is going on, because if you just look at the plot below here, it seems to be non-stationary. But the truth data set is actually the one above. So this here is just part of a longer oscillation, a temporary drift. So sometimes you'll say you need a longer horizon to actually say that it's non-stationary. But if you're only presented with this data down here, you would need, you need to model it as a non-stationary data set. This is also one of the reasons why in economy you often have what's called unit root models, where you have this non-stationary behavior, and you also have, and you can probably see it from up here, um, that the parameters does change over time. So fitting one model fits none effectively. Because you can do something, and within this course, we won't make it too complicated, but often in real life systems, the underlying physics are changing over time. It could be from a biological system where you say, you're modeling the concentration of something in water, but then there is from year to year, there are some 
changes. There are some temperature differences, other things that actually drive the process differently at different points in time. And if you do not build that into your model, then you will see that the parameters change over time. Ideally, you will make a complex model that kind of does the whole thing for you. But it's not always that you have sufficient information to do so. So, selecting the model order. This is what we want to do at first. So we want to use the autocorrelation function to help us pick the model order. If that fails, well, there are multiple reasons for that to fail. Now, the, the examples I showed you earlier on are simulated examples. So you can say that's cheating. When you get to get the real life data, Things are not as nice, generally. Um, so, I mean, reasons could be that it's not, it just isn't an AR model. It's not a moving average model. It's not an armor model. But it could be something else. Sometimes you can do something about it. Sometimes you cannot. Try a different model structure. You can always do that. What is more often the case is that you should not look at the data on the scale that you looked at. I can disclose now for the data that you use for assignment one, you have a trend, right? So given what we know now, what would be a, the appropriate thing to do? If you were going to model that data as an ARIMA model, what would, you, what would you do to figure out how to, which model to pick? And then you would see that it goes, doesn't go sufficiently fast to zero. It's not stationary, exactly. And you all know that. So what would you do then? Yes? How? You can do it, but it's not stationary. A box cox transformation would not help you. What should you do when you have non stationary data? Yes? Difference it. Then that would actually work okay. Those of you who have a financial background would probably do something different, if you remember your introduction to finance, financial engineering kind of course. What you often do there, well, if it differs, what do you look at? Then you look at what is the price today minus yesterday. But if you look, remember the data, and I noticed some of you also noticed that the variance also increased with time. I don't know if you remember that. As you look at the first observations, there was some very little noise, but the later observations you have more noise if you look at the data. Just look at any plot from the first assignment and you should see that. So as the variance increases with the value that you're modeling, you should consider transformations. And within financial Data, the typical thing to do is to calculate the so-called log return. So you first calculate the log of the price, and then you do the diff, the differencing of that. So what does that give? That gives us the logarithm of price at time t, minus the log of the price at time t minus 1, which is equal to the logarithm of the change in price or the, from time t to p, t minus 1, t minus 1. The ratio between the price today and the price yesterday is called the return. Take the log of that and it usually behaves nicer. If you do this for the assignment one data, 
The global mean value will actually be the best model of all. So if you had known a little bit more about what you could do with data, you can make a very simple model that is very efficient for that. For that, kind of, for that particular series, you can also say the exponential smoothing would be fine. But you would actually want to have a very large forgetting factor, so you remember pretty much everything. So if you do the, the appropriate transformations, you can also get to something where the model is simpler. And we also always want to go for the most parsimonious model. Let me just see two more slides, and we'll have a break. So what I mentioned previously was that when you have something that, that's very complex, what you want to do is you start off by some model, then you estimate the parameters. We'll get back to that. And then you look at the residuals from that model. And if it's not white noise, then you look at what do they look like. Often you have something where there's still some autocorrelation function, or uh, autocorrelation, or partial autocorrelation left in that signal. So when you look at the residuals, so before we saw that the structure of these epsilons was an AR2 model. But by doing the differencing and looking at the residuals there, it was easy to identify which model to use for this. So what you should do then is to look at the residuals and make a model for that. Hopefully you get some white noise there. Consider which model you need. And then you kind of combine the two. In practice, you do it slightly different. But the line of thought is the same. So let's look at the one case where we said that we definitely needed an ARMA 1, 1 model. Then we look at the residuals from that. If the residuals from that looks like, let's just, just look at the residual analysis and not ignore what it says at the top. If this is the residual analysis from this model, what we agreed on earlier is that this is an AR2 model, right? So we need to I'll just multiply it with an AR2. So this model here has a phi of order 1 model on yt. And then we had the moving average part here over, over here, theta of b on epsilon t. So that was the first model that we made. And now we say that we also need an AR2 model. And the way we do that is to have a phi, I'll just call it phi star, that we multiply on this. So effectively, rather than estimating parameters in these two independent polynomials, this is the first order, this is the second order. So what is the combined polynomial here? What is the order of this? combined polynomial. Sorry? Third order, exactly. You take a second order polynomial and multiply it by a first order polynomial, you get a third order polynomial. So the model that we have down here is an armor 3, 1. So basically what we'll do be doing is that we will start with an initial model, look at what more do we need, and then try to fit that model and hope that we get white noise after doing that. Let's have a break until quarter past. <laughs>